We've always told people don't use a MacBook Air for your live main stage keys rig. The specs just weren't there. It didn't seem like it was reliable enough to trust for live performance. But that may have all changed with the new MacBook Airs that were released in the fall of 2020 that feature Apple's new M1 chip. All of a sudden, the MacBook Air has the exact same chip as the Mac Mini and as the brand new MacBook Pros. Since that release, we've gotten probably hundreds of questions from folks wondering, is this the new best option for setting up a budget main stage keys rig for your church? So we bought one. I've got a brand new in the box MacBook Air right here. Today, we're gonna open it up, put it through its paces. We're gonna install main stage, connect our keyboard audio interface, run our Sunday keys template and see what the new MacBook Air can do. If it performs well, this very well may be a game changing option for folks looking to invest in a new computer to run their main stage keys rig. Now, in this video, we're gonna get really practical. I'm gonna help you understand the differences between the different MacBook Air configurations available, talk about the Intel computers that Apple is still selling and compare the differences between the MacBook Air, the Mac Mini, and the MacBook Pro, all of which feature the new M1 chip. So in this video, we're gonna not just talk about performance of this specific computer, but help you understand the differences and the considerations that should be top of mind for you if you're considering investing in a brand new computer for your church. So let's dive right in. I'm excited to unbox this guy and get set up with main stage. We went for the base 999 model of the MacBook Air with the M1 chip. And the only upgrade I did was bring the RAM up from the eight gigabytes standard up to 16 gigabytes. And I'll talk about why in a minute. Get this out here. Always find Apple packaging to be so very satisfying. Okay, here it is. And that is super lightweight. So there it is, this is rose gold. I've never had a rose gold Mac before. Thought I'd give it a try. And man, this is so lightweight. I haven't held a MacBook Air in a long time. It's just crazy. It feels like a tablet essentially at this point. Um, but yeah, so we've got the computer and then packaging for the charging cable here. And then only thing other than that, designed by Apple in California and the little charging plug. So set that aside for now. We don't really need it. Just gonna open up the computer for the first time. Man, this feels tiny compared to my 16 inch. I do love that they added that classic sound back in. Okay, so I've got everything opened up, just going through the initial setup process. So there's a few differences here between the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air. One of them is that the MacBook Air doesn't have a touch bar. If you love the touch bar, then that might be a bummer for you. I really am pretty ambivalent towards the touch bar, so it's not a big deal to me. I'm actually kind of excited to have physical buttons again. I don't hate the touch bar, I just feel like it doesn't really add anything other than some extra expense to the hardware. But though you don't have a touch bar, you do still have touch ID in the top right corner, which is cool for quickly unlocking stuff. Uh, one of the biggest differences is actually a sort of a performance difference that I'm curious to see if actually makes much of an impact. The MacBook Air here is fanless and the MacBook Pro and the Mac Mini uh, both have fans. If you're not familiar with what a fan does inside of a computer, it's in charge of keeping components cool. So if your computer's working really hard and components start to get too hot, uh, the computer will actually slow down those components. It's called throttling in order to make sure that they don't melt or break. Um, a fan helps to just lower the overall temperature of your computer. So if the MacBook Air gets too hot, uh, it's more likely to throttle in theory uh, than the MacBook Air or the Mac Mini because it doesn't have a fan. In the real world, we'll see if it actually makes a difference um, because the kind of stuff that we are going to be using this computer for are not really complex rendering tasks like uh, exporting video or animation or something like that. We're doing a lot of real time audio processing. While main stage is loading up here, scanning audio units, all that stuff, I wanna talk about another consideration with the MacBook Air. 
the default configuration or the least expensive configuration available right now featuring the M1 chip is currently at the time of this video, 999. Now that comes with eight gigabytes of RAM, a 256 gigabyte solid state drive and a seven core GPU. If you spend another $200, then you can get uh, a base model still with eight gigabytes of RAM, the exact same M1 chip, but a 512 gigabyte solid state drive and an eight core GPU. So for $200, you're doubling the storage space and you're getting an extra core uh, for the GPU. It's still eight gigabytes of RAM. So for either of those configurations, you can pay another $200 to double the amount of RAM from eight gigabytes to 16 gigabytes. And these upgrade costs are pretty much the same as what you're gonna run into with the Mac mini and with the MacBook Pro M1 options. The important thing that I wanna emphasize here is that no matter what, it's the exact same M1 chip in all of these computers, at least as it stands right now at the time of shooting this video. Previously, when you'd be comparing a MacBook Pro to a MacBook Air, to a Mac mini, to an iMac, you'd have tons and tons of different variants or variations on the Intel processors that were included. Dual core, quad core, how many virtual cores, all of that stuff. What this means for you, if you're setting up a keys rig, is that there's way less of a difference in performance between the Air, the Pro, and the Mini than it used to be before M1 was released by Apple. So what I did is started with the 999 base model with 256 gigabytes of storage space. And the only thing I upgraded was $200 to get 16 gigabytes of RAM. I wanna explain why I didn't upgrade the SSD and why I think you should strongly consider paying $200 to get the 16 gigabytes of RAM. Let's start off with the solid state drive. 256 gigabytes in the drive is not that much. You're gonna tear through that pretty quickly. I mean, main stages, factory libraries, over 50 gigabytes. Sunday Keys takes up several gigabytes of storage space. And, you know, these days files are big. If you've got video files or other plugins that you want to install, like Omnisphere, stuff from Native Instruments, you're going to start running out of space. So why don't I recommend upgrading to a bigger solid state drive? Because it's just less expensive to do it yourself with an external hard drive like this. Um, this is a two terabyte drive that costs less than $200. So you could pay Apple $200 to get another 250, uh, 256 gigabytes on your solid state drive, or you could pocket that money, get an external drive when you need it and only when you need it to hold your sample libraries or whatever else you need to. So to me, it just makes more fiscal sense to use an external drive rather than pay Apple for that upgrade. Why you should upgrade the RAM to 16 gigabytes? Because you, you can't do that externally. You can't buy an external RAM. You're stuck with whatever your configuration is inside of the computer that you buy. Eight gigabytes of RAM, I think will be obsolete for most live applications within the next five years. It's not currently. You could probably get away with running stock main stage plugins, running Sunday keys with eight gigabytes of RAM only but it's just not future-proof. If you wanna run Omnisphere, Native Instruments, Spitfire Audio, future main stage concerts or Ableton Live rigs that will be more complex and require more processing power, eight gigabytes of RAM is just gonna run out a lot more quickly than 16 gigabytes of RAM. Now I will say that right now, we know lots of folks in our audience at Sunday Sounds are actually using an eight gigabyte of RAM MacBook Air with great success. And I actually don't doubt that. I think we're gonna see really great performance from the M1 chip. From the benchmarks we've seen, even with eight gigabytes of RAM, the M1 chip is just really powerful. I think 16 gigabytes of RAM is a smart choice. It's worth the $200 uh, to make sure that you're gonna be good to go with this computer for the next five, six, seven, eight years without regretting the fact that you're not able to do everything you wanna do down the road. So we got main stage open, still downloading some of the additional content in the background, but not really worried about that. Got my keyboard connected, which is class compliant, uh, which just means it's plug and play. It doesn't need a driver or anything. And that's working. Got the Nano Control 2 here, which is also class compliant. Uh, and that's plugged in and working as well. So I could assign that to the workspace however I wanted. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is main stage exactly how I would expect it, exactly as I am familiar with it, but super fast, like my goodness. Uh, the patch changes are really quick. These changes, uh, as you can see on screen, are happening really, really quickly, um, which is great. And the sounds, all sound as I would expect. So that's really cool. Um, 
Now this is just the, the keyboard, you know, starting concert. Okay, so we got Sunday keys installed really quick. Open nice and fast, under 30 seconds. At least on par with Intel base systems, maybe even a little bit faster. Uh, recording screen now. So all I've done is gone ahead and assigned keyboard, mod wheel, and sustain pedal. Everything else, nano control two is working out of the box. Um, and this is Sunday keys. Patch changes are instant. I mean, faster visually and seamless from an audio standpoint. The UI is keeping up, you know, absolutely no problem. And everything looks great. I mean, this is the main stage that I expect, maybe just feeling a little bit faster, a little bit snappier. I don't know how much of that is confirmation bias, but it's definitely not a degraded experience compared to my older MacBook Pro, the 2017 or the 2019, uh, which 2019 was over triple the cost <laughs> of this computer, which uh, makes me sad. <laughs> but it's also exciting because, man, this computer is just, it's excellent. Um, it's really running this well, uh, no concerns so far. So let's go into some preference stuff because I want to kind of keep an eye on what we're looking at. So first let's show the toolbar, CPU and memory meters. So we can see CPU usage here is negligible. There's very little CPU usage. And as we are changing patches, we are seeing what we would expect. A slight jump in CPU as main stage is managing both patches at the same time. And then once that patch change is executed, we're good to go. We're right back down. Memory usage here, we're not using much of the memory, uh, just a, the expected amount for, um, you know, some sample based instruments like the grand piano and Sunday keys. And the CPU percentage here, 8% of the CPU right now. As I'm playing, it's staying really minimal. Um, I'll note here, I've got Sunday Keys open. We're only using three gigabytes of memory for main stage specifically. So I know I said 16 gigabytes of RAM is future proofing. I really mean that. I, I guess if you're not concerned about the future, you really could get away with eight gigabytes of RAM for now. But again, I think if, if you can spring it, if you can afford the $200, you won't regret it necessarily, especially as your ambitions might grow. You might want to use more uh, memory intense or processor intense um, plugins down the road. But, so let's artificially make things a little harder for the computer here. Let's bring the buffer size down to 32. The higher the buffer, the more time you give the computer to think, process the audio and output it. So, haha, it crashed. <laughs> Uh-oh. So we ran into our first hiccup here, changing the buffer size uh, in main stage, just crashed uh, main stage. That's not that big of a deal, I guess. It's a little concerning. Um, I'm gonna reload main stage and Sunday keys here. Changing your buffer size is something you're never going to do during a live performance, but it is interesting that that just happened because that's not a normal thing. Uh, let's go ahead and see what happens here. We're going to open this back up and see where our buffer is at, see if we need to change it again. Go to audio preferences, advanced, we are at 32 now. I will say it just loaded in like 10 seconds. So, so with the buffer at 32, we're seeing the CPU is about half. And that's of a single core, and there are four cores uh, on M1. It's weird, some of the terms we always used to use to describe this stuff just don't quite apply uh, to M1 because it's, it's not quite like anything that's ever been in a Mac computer before. Okay, but we're still, we're still rock solid. I mean, the latency is so low, uh, it's below the threshold for me being able to even notice it. We're looking at 3.4 milliseconds round trip. For context, a real acoustic piano has between five, maybe eight milliseconds, and most humans can't detect latency if it's uh, maybe eight to 10 milliseconds and we can start to actually notice it. So we're pushing the computer really hard here, harder than we have to. I'm gonna change the buffer here to go to 16. I'm gonna see if main stage crashes again. That would be a, a bug, I guess. Not really a performance bug, but something that you'd have to deal with during your preparation. So we're gonna change this, uh, but this is all I'm gonna say. My MIDI peripherals are working great. Performance is great. Sunday key, it did crash again. Yeah, okay, so we are able to crash main stage by changing 
the buffer size. I don't have confirmation on how broadly that applies, but it's happened twice in a row now here. So I might try a restart of the computer at some point to see if that fixes it. Again, this isn't a performance problem. You're never going to do buffer changes during performance, but it is something that you know demonstrates we are still working with software created by real people that isn't perfect. Okay, now our buffer sits 16, which is an incredibly small buffer. Like incredibly small, so, so small. We tell people use 128, 256, even 512. So this is much, much smaller than you'd ever need it to be for a live performance. I'm just gonna confirm that that's where we actually are here. Yep, buffer of 16, so 2.4 milliseconds of round trip, two milliseconds of output latency. It's pretty bonkers. Um, but Sunday Keys is performing great. Uh, main stage is performing great. Now we're seeing some high CPU usage. Almost peaking on that one core, just because that buffer is so low. As we start to change patches, I'm hearing that the audio from the previous patch is cutting out immediately. It's not uh, being sustained as we would like. This is main stage choosing to support or give audio for the new patch versus the old one. It's what you want it to do, but it also lets me know that we're pushing the computer sort of to its limitations now in terms of what it can handle all at once. So here's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna go back to preferences. We're gonna go to a normal buffer size again, 128. We'll see if main stage crashes here. Be curious if it does. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a channel strip uh, with a basic instrument and an arpeggiator on it. So it's gonna generate a bunch of notes. Then I'm just gonna set some stuff on the keyboard. I'm gonna duplicate that channel strip maybe 15 or 16 times. So there's 15 or 16 sounds all in this one patch, all triggering notes over and over and over. I'm gonna set some stuff on the keyboard. So there's maybe a dozen or so notes being fed into those arps. Then I'm just gonna walk away from the computer for a while, for about 30 minutes. And I'm gonna just let those notes continually be triggered um, because I want to see if over time, as we play a bunch of notes in main stage, is the MacBook Air going to get hotter? Uh, remember I said earlier there's no fan inside here. So if the computer starts to work really hard and those components get hotter, we should see the computer to save those components, slow down the processing, sort of throttle everything down. And that's good if you don't want your computer to melt, but it's also not good if you need peak performance from your system for a long time. I'm gonna set that up now, and then we'll check back in in about 30 minutes. And we'll see how it's going. Okay, so. This has been going for about 40 minutes now. And uh, let's see how we're looking. So, uh, I was in the room while this was all happening and nothing crashed. Uh, just kind of keeping an eye on stuff. And uh, CPU usage, man, crazy. I'm seeing, you know, maybe 20% more after 30 or 40 minutes, which is really, really good. Um, and everything is just working as I would typically expect. So feeling the body of the computer itself. It's a little warm, but it's not nearly as hot as my MacBook Pros would be after 30 minutes of running main stage like that. And it's completely silent. So is the lack of fan in the MacBook Air an issue? Doesn't seem like it to me. I mean, maybe if you were running a bunch of instances of Omnisphere and Keyscape and you were playing for hours and you were outside, uh, maybe, you know, but I, I'm not seeing it here with what I would consider normal main stage use, even above normal main stage use of, I mean, 16 sounds all at once playing tons and tons of notes all at once for 30 or 40 minutes um, at a really usable buffer size didn't cause any issues at all. Um, as I change patches, seeing you know, I would say below average CPU spikes and I'm able to sustain audio. So, you know, honestly, I'm not surprised by the great results I'm getting with this MacBook Air. After the review we did of the Mac Mini a few months ago, at that point, I was a pretty firm believer in just how incredible the new M1 chip is. All that Apple was able to accomplish with their very first attempt at doing something like this. I do think it's a, a brand new gauntlet for the rest of the industry and um, comparing this to Intel-based computers, this really does seem like a clear winner 
to me. So would I recommend a MacBook Air for your main stage keys rig? Yeah, I absolutely would. There's a few caveats here. Uh, screen size, 13 inch, feels a little small to me because I'm used to my 16 inch MacBook Pro. Whether or not that's something that's important to you, that's a personal call. Uh, other differences, lack of fan we've already talked about. I don't think that's an issue. The cost is better. Uh, lack of touch bar, not a deal breaker for me and probably not for you if you're using your computer for live performance. You're probably not touching the touch bar at all anyway. In terms of compatibility with various software and with MIDI and audio peripherals and stuff, some of that's still being worked out. Had a little bit of a, a journey getting my audio interface to work, had to run it through Rosetta, set some weird security preferences and stuff. But, you know, I mean, this is the direction Apple's going. They're very plain about that. So hardware manufacturers, software manufacturers are going to catch up. So if you're in the market now, even if one or two of your devices is maybe sketchy or not quite supported yet, if you can tolerate dealing with that ambiguity or maybe using a different keyboard for a month or two, I wouldn't buy an older computer, an older Mac right now, because this is just so powerful. And the value for the cost, I think this is probably the greatest value, just the whole M1 line that we've seen from Apple, maybe for as long as I can remember, especially when it comes to main stage focus uses. The one exception I'm going to mention in terms of compatibility is that Ableton Live, we got a lot of Ableton Live users in our audience, still really seems to be struggling both on the Big Sur OS and on M1 hardware specifically, especially with Ableton Live 11. Now, by the time this video comes out, hopefully some of those issues have been worked on, but it has been sort of an ongoing thing with M1 compatibility with Ableton Live, Ableton Live 11. Uh, the Big Sur OS, all of those ingredients coming together, it just hasn't been as reliable as we typically assume Ableton Live is going to be. Again, hopefully by the time this video comes out, there's been some more progress made, and I have no doubt that over the next year, hopefully sooner, all of those issues will be resolved, and Ableton Live is going to be as solid or more solid than it's ever been before. But for right now, if you're an Ableton Live user, I don't think M1 is ready for you. If you're a main stage user, I would say emphatically, yes, this MacBook Air would be a great choice. Um, lastly, let's talk about uh, which you should buy, a Mini, an Air, or a Pro. To me, the Mini might seem compelling because it's the least expensive option. It starts at $799, and that's pretty awesome, but you have to buy a keyboard, you have to buy a mouse, you have to buy a screen, you have to connect all that stuff together, contrive a way to make it look functional and be functional on stage. So if you are one who likes to sort of DIY and wants to build a unique rig and is on a razor thin budget, the Mac Mini could be a killer way to accomplish that. If you want the simplest way that's also really budget friendly to set up a keys rig, I think the MacBook Air is a clear choice for me over the MacBook Pro, at least as it stands right now with some limited experience here, just seeing everything that M1 can do. Again, the MacBook Pro and the MacBook Air have the exact same M1 chip inside of them. And we're not doing complex rendering tasks or video tasks. We're not pushing the GPU, so we don't need that extra core. Um, and we, we really don't need the fan, I don't think either, um, unless we're playing in really, really hot context potentially. But even then you could purchase an external fan or a cooling mat and place it under the MacBook Air and still be under the budget cost of purchasing a MacBook Pro. Now I will say that this is just the beginning for Apple Silicon based computers. So I'm sure we'll see, you know, the next iteration of this technology within the next six months or the next year. So if you're not in the market right now, it's not necessarily a bad idea to wait a little while and see what Apple does next. If you're already happy with the hardware you've got, I don't think this is a must upgrade or something. I'm, if your Intel Mac is doing a good job and you have a reliable live rig, don't upgrade for the sake of upgrading. Save your money, see what Apple does. But when you're in the market, whether you're building a rig for the first time or you're looking to upgrade your hardware, M1's the future. The Apple Silicon infrastructure, I think, is going to be really exciting to keep an eye on over the next several years. Um, yeah, and that's that's really all I'll say. I mean, this little thing has really impressed me. Um, it's awesome. I really like it. It feels great. Super lightweight. The battery life is insane. Um, you could probably you could run set list unplugged with the battery life from the reports that we've seen the benchmarks that we've seen It's absolutely silent. There's no fan um, It's super cool. 
You've got a couple limitations here with only two USB-C ports, but uh, dongle will fix that. We've all gotten used to a world where we need dongles. Um, so that's not a deal breaker as long as you're comfortable figuring that sort of thing out. And the price is just right. It's absolutely insane. So I hope that this is helpful to you. If you need more help figuring out how to set up a main stage keys rig, we've talked about the computer today, but we also have info on picking a MIDI keyboard, audio interface, how to actually set up main stage for volunteers. We'll put a link in the description of this video to our free main stage basics course. That's a video course that walks through all the considerations and makes it easy for you to pick the right ingredients, work within any budget, and get good results for the keys position at your church. If you want to learn more about the Sunday Keys Template, which is our all-in-one, done-for-you worship keys resource for main stage, uh, we'll put a link in the description to Sunday Keys as well. Leave a comment and let us know if you have any questions that we didn't answer in this video, or maybe you're using an M1 Mac yourself. Let us know how it's going. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. We really appreciate that support. We'll see you in the next video.